So there's these questions we all ask, big questions that have a huge effect on our lives. But there's all this information out there that makes finding a solution difficult. So we came up with a better way to give you the answers that you need. We did a survey at Easter and compiled a list of your top six most asked questions. That list then became a roadmap for this message series. Each week, we'll examine a single question and discover God's answers based on His Word. It's a series we like to call, You Asked For It. All right, well, good morning. Good to see you today. Glad you're here. If you're joining us online, welcome. We are in a series at the tail end of it. You asked for it. So we're, we've are we been doing some incredible subjects, really, really uh, provocative. You guys think amazing thoughts and so glad to have you participate in the selection of, of what we talk about. Well, today we're going to be talking about hypocrisy. I think we all are familiar with the challenges of talking to people, inviting them to church, and hearing, number one response, right, why would I go to church? It's just filled with hypocrites. Who hasn't heard that? I mean, that is certainly, the, and it, all surveys show it's the number one thing people say about church people, that it's filled with hypocrites. Now, if the person you're talking to knows anything about history, you know, church history in specific, but history, uh, and, and you get into a dialogue with them, you better be ready for maybe, a, you know, a, the, good, the better half of an afternoon as they start to recount the Crusades, the Spanish Inquisition, when they, you know, talk about, you know, more recently, you know, the Catholic, uh, Roman Catholic pedophiles and the cover-up of the, of the hierarchy, and the list goes on, right? And then if they personally grew up in church, they may have a story themselves about, hey, I, I grew up, my parents made me go to church all the time, and when we got home, I saw them just argue like cats and dogs. My wife and my mom suffered with, uh, you know, anxiety and depression and took medication for that, and dad had his, you know, his porno addiction, and, and, uh, and then they ended up getting divorced anyways, and I mean, just the list goes on, right? So they'll just have all of the stuff. And, and here's what happens when, when I'm talking to somebody and I hear them uh, say that there's hypocrites at church. My response generally is, you don't know the half of it. <laughs> it's, it's worse than you could imagine. <laughs> it's everywhere. And the reason is because it's human nature. Human nature, we all have this part of us that is hypocritical. It's hypocritical. And if you go to church, now there's a hypocrite at church. And so, so it's, it's just part of the human condition. But one of the things that sometimes we do, I think, in an attempt to deflect you know, this barrage of anger and accusation is we try to sometimes piously rewrite history and make it sound like it's not true, maybe. Like, but but you, it's really hard to do that. Because when you read the Bible, it's filled with heroes, <laughs> biblical characters, biblical heroes that are flawed, that have all kinds of problems, and the Bible's real clear about it. I mean, you have Jacob, who is a manipulator and a thief and a swindler, and you have Samson who had runaway addiction of lust, and you had David who was an adulterer and a murderer, and it, I mean, it goes on and on and on. And in church history, you have people like Martin Luther who started the Protestant Reformation, but was also, you know, a, a you know, he had violent tendencies, he was vulgar, he was an anti-Semite, you, you, you had like this guy, C.T. Studd, who's a great athlete in England, the best cricket player, and ended up being a missionary, but started all kinds of problems and arguing within missionaries, became a morphine addict. I mean, the list goes on. So trying to rewrite history is not helpful. It's better just to own it, you know, just say, it's true. It is true. There is plenty of hypocrisy uh, in the church as well as in the world. I mean, I, I think everybody struggles with that. And now in the New Testament, the word hypocrisy actually is a theatrical word. 
Uh, back in those days, they would have amphitheaters. They don't have big screens like we have today. And so people that sat in the back couldn't really see uh, the expression uh, of the actors. And so they would wear masks. They would put up, and that's, that's actually the Thespian Society, one of, their, uh, one of their symbols are these two masks, which is roots all the way back to New Testament days when they would put a mask up so somebody in the far back could see what expression they were trying to uh, convey. And they were called hypocrites when they would do that. Hypocrites, they would wear masks. We wear masks. That's what we do. We're, a lot of us are really good at it. Uh, we wear masks because we don't want people to know what's going on in our lives. And so we play cover-up. But that is what it means to be a hypocrite. Now, I realize that hypocrite, nobody wants to be called a hypocrite, and it's a pejorative. So a lot of times it picks up extra baggage. And so let's get a uh, kind of rally what, what we're talking about today. A hypocrite is, is when you, your declared values are better than your actual values. Now, I think that includes pretty much everybody. I guess if you're, you know, you know, some thug in prison or something, you might say, no, that's exactly what I wanted to do, you know. But I think beyond, you know, some, some, some fringe people, I think this includes everybody. Hey, I have declared stated values. I'm trying to live this out, but my life doesn't match it. And the root problem, the root cause is how we're focusing on looking good as opposed to being good, having life change. And that is the core issue. That's why if we're, today's message is, what do we do with all the hypocrites in the church? Well, we can't solve all of the problems, but certainly we can address the part we play. And if we're going to do that, then we're going to have to change what we focus on. Change what we focus on. Okay, so let's look at what, what makes a hypocrite. How do we end up in that box where we're standing accused and guilty? Well, Here's the things that make up a hypocrite within Christianity. One is, is when we focus on formulas. You know, we're looking for some kind of like, you know, Vegas, uh, you know, what's the secret recipe? What's the, you know, the slot machine? If I just get these numbers right, you know, then I'll get, I can force blessings out of heaven. You know, what three things do I need to do to have a happy marriage? What, what, how many Hail Marys or, you know, Our Fathers do I need to say in order to get freed from this addiction? I mean, we're, we're always, that, when, we, when we reduce it to a formula and treat God like he's some kind of cosmic genie, and he just, you just rub the lamp in a certain way and say the certain magic words, you know, hocus pocus or whatever, all of a sudden, you know, blessings come because we are tapped into the formula. What? That will lead nowhere. That will lead nowhere. In fact, really all it is is it becomes burdensome because it's not the way God operates. And so we're trying to live up to all of these standards. We're trying to curry favor with God, and it becomes burdensome. And when religious leaders get behind that, it be, they themselves can't even do it. Well, this is what was happening in Jesus' day. Religious leaders were saying, do these certain things, these rules, these regulations, and that will make God bless you. But they, they had so many rules, nobody could do it. It says, Jesus responded, you are, here, okay, we're going to see this a few times because we are talking about this subject. He says, you're hypocrites, you experts of the law. He's talking about these religious experts. He says, you crush people beneath the burden of obeying. Some people, that's their view of religion. That's their view of Christianity. It's just a burden of obeying. It's just, and they've got enough problems in life. The last thing they need to do is go hear a bunch of stuff that they can't do and then just makes them feel bad. A burden of obeying impossible religious regulations. Yet you would never even think of doing them yourselves, which makes them hypocrites. We have to be careful about that. Now, in our church, we have small groups and we ask if you've not been part of a small group before and you're new to our church, we ask that you go through our Freedom Small Groups. We have four going on right now. You, they, they're, they're closed now, but when they'll open up in February, we ask you, start there. Start there. 
If you've, if you've been in our church and, you, and you've been in a small group and you haven't taken freedom, we, are, we ask you, take the freedom group. And the reason is because we're trying to address some of this. This is one of the things we address. And we talk about it as eating, because God says that there's a, there's, there was two trees in the Garden of Eden, and one caused life, one caused death. And this is the one he's talking about that caused death. The one where you eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And he says it just causes death. It, it causes us to fall into a place where we're cut off from what we're trying to achieve. We end up having this burden, this burden. Here's another way that the Bible talks about it. They will appear to have a godly life. Notice the key. They appear, they appear to have a godly life, but they will not let its power change them. That's what hypocrisy is, where we're trying to live out these religious rules and we somehow get cut off from the power that makes it real for us. So we read the Bible, but life change isn't happening. We're just kind of like, you know, reading it. And, and you know, we, we go to work and, you know, if you're a boss and, and, and people know that you're a Christian, you go to church, but you're, you know, you're unfair to your employees or, you, you know, and you're cruel to your spouse and, you know, you, you're, you're, you have out of control addictions that you're covering up. Now, all of us are struggling with stuff. We're all kind of in progress, but when we cover it up and we make it look like we're fine, that's a, hypocr- that's a hypocrite. That's hypocrisy coming out in our lives because it's, it's, it's all about what we appear. We want to make it look like we're better than we are. And that causes problems. So the truth is real Christianity is about friendship with Christ. Friendship. Am I becoming kinder? Am I becoming uh, gentler? Am I becoming more compassionate? Am I becoming more generous? These are the things that happens when we have a friendship with with Christ. Well, we don't want to be a church filled with hypocrites, uh, so we want to reduce the numbers. How do we do that? Number two, first is all about formulas. We need to be careful it's not all about performance, what other people think of us. Looking at, hey, you know, because if you look at other people, you'll find yourself getting, doing things for them, looking for validation, looking for approval, and then you end up on this hamster wheel of performance, always running around Checking boxes, spiritual boxes. Okay, well, you know, I, I got to go to a small group. I got to go to church. I got to give. I got to pray. I got to read my Bible. You're just checking boxes, but nothing's really happening inside. Now, Jesus talks about three spiritual disciplines that are very good. Prayer, I think all of I mean, give, being generous and fasting, which he says, and Jesus did them all. But he says, done with an eye of performance, some of those core spiritual disciplines that are so important can go off in our lives. Here's what he says. When you give a gift to a beggar, he's talking about generosity, right? When you give a gift to a beggar, don't shout about it as the hypocrites do or call attention to their acts of charity. And when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites who pretend piety by praying public. He's not saying don't pray. He's saying if you're praying for performance to be recognized by other people, he goes, you're, you're falling into a trap by praying publicly on street corners where everyone can see. And when you fast, it's a good practice, de- declining your food for a spiritual purpose. Nothing wrong with that. But if it's all about performance, he says, don't do it publicly as the hypocrites do, who try to look wane and disheveled so people will feel sorry for them. What's wrong? I'm fasting. It's tough. You know, I wouldn't have to fast if you didn't have any, so, many, so many problems. I'm fasting for you, you know. <laughs> All the kinds of things that go on. I know when I first learned about fasting years and years ago, they said, oh, yeah, yeah, you should always got to have mints. I said, why? This is because when you fast, your body's like purging itself and you end up with bad breath. And you know what? I, I, think, it's, I think it's true, you know. And so if I'm, if I'm, if I've got a mint in my mouth, no, I just, I, I actually, I, I have mints all the time, so you'll never know. But I think, 
when I was told that, I think their heart was in the right place. But it's, it's, hey, are you doing it for other people so that you can get recognized? Are you doing it because you want to be more like Christ? And when we're more like Christ and we're moving in that direction, we, we're less, there's, there's less incongruency in our life from what we, our stated values into what we're actually doing. One of the things that was challenging for me when I first became a Christ follower, I was all, I was off the map, way off the reservation in moral behavior. I mean, I was doing all kinds of stuff. And when I came to Christ, I met, before that, I didn't know any Christians. I met a couple Christians. And the first, early on, the first few Christians I met, their life was exactly like mine. The only difference is they went to church and they had some religious lingo. And I thought, this is weird. You know, I mean, I thought, I thought it meant more. You know, I didn't know I was just going to church and then throwing a few hallelujahs and the rest of my life looks exact. No. Well, it turns out they were living a life of incongruency. They were living, they, 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 it was hypocrisy. And uh, it wasn't long until I learned that not everybody is like that. And having a powerful role model can be a huge catalyst in saying, I can do it too. I don't have to be like somebody that I know is not, you know, the role model for what we're supposed to be as Christ followers. Here's the truth. The truth is, it really comes down to life change. You, you can just read the Bible and not have your life changed. You can pray and not have your life changed. You can do a lot of spiritual, you can do all of them. So it comes down to, God, I want to change. I want to become more like you. So we don't want to be in the route the, 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 with all of the other hypocrites. Right? We want to be moving away from that. How do you do that? Well, don't make it all about formula. It's certainly not about performance. And then tradition can get in the way. Now, you know, tradition's kind of cool. You know, there's traditions of uh, the holidays, you know, that are, you know, they're, they're fun. They're nostalgic. You have traditions. Families have traditions that kind of pull them together. And but that's not what Jesus is talking about. When he comes against traditions, he's talking about spiritual practices that really are empty. They're hollow. You're just doing them. You're just, it's just rote. You're not even thinking about it anymore. And that can happen in so many different ways where we just kind of just, or we, we divorce our heart from what's really happening uh, in our, you know, what we're doing, what we're saying. And he says that that's a problem. Here's what Jesus in his, in his uh, gentle way says, frauds and hypocrites. I mean, it's not that gentle, right? They, they pretend to worship me, but their worship is nothing more than empty traditions. Empty traditions created by people. He goes, that, that can get in the way. And, if it, and often it does. You know, something happened years ago. You had an encounter, some kind of spiritual encounter. And, and then some people, that's, they live their whole life just looking back. Just looking back. Instead of what God wants to do in your life today. Some people read the book of Acts and, they, and, and, and there's all these miracles and they'll say, oh, to live in those days. Wouldn't that be awesome? Did you know the book of Acts says we are living in those days? This is the, this is the, the day that God is performing miracles and doing amazing things. And we could be praying for that and moving in that. Instead, a lot of people, they just, it's an empty tradition. Well, they just read the book of Acts like it's a history book. It is not a history book. You read the book of Acts, it is a menu. <laughs> what do I want to eat today? This is what I want in my life. And start praying towards that and moving towards that in faith. You know, there was a guy in the Bible, Old Testament, one of the kings. He was one of the good kings. There, some of the kings weren't all that good. One of the good kings, a guy named King Hezekiah. And the Bible says he was good because he encouraged the people of God to move away from empty traditions. And then it gives an example. Uh, one of the examples is, is 800 years earlier, Moses was leading the people of Israel through the desert. And they, there were some different things that had happened to them while they were in the desert. One of them was they were attacked by serpents, deadly, venomous uh, snakes. Now, that's a problem, right? And people were dying. They come to Moses. Moses, a lot of people are dying of, these, of the venom. What do we do? He, Moses prays about it. God says, okay, Make a bronze snake. Put it up on a, uh, on a pole. 
when people look at it, if they get bit and they look at it, even though that venom is in their, in their veins, they will be healed. Now, that was, that was true. That did work. It was an incredible miracle. It also prophesied and projected what Jesus was going to stand for. He was going to be that snake and snakes, you know, the, the snake that had the venom, all the curse of Jesus, all the curse of sin was going to be on Jesus. And when we sinners, because we have sin in our veins like that venom, when we look at Jesus who hung on the cross, we get healed. That's what it, that's what it looked to. But so anyways, they kept this, they didn't know all that. We know that now looking back. But they kept this snake for 800 years, this bronze snake. And after a while, they started, you know, veering off from their spiritual path. And they said, well, why don't we, God did something back then. Well, let's just worship that thing. And King Hezekiah comes and goes, no, no, no. That is an empty tradition. Notice he says, King Hezekiah broke up the bronze serpent that Moses had made because the people of Israel had begun to worship it by burning incense to it, even though it was merely a piece of, of metal. It was a piece of bronze. It was a empty tradition. It's, you know what, this happens to us if we're not careful. We find ourselves looking back instead of looking at what God wants to do in our lives right now. And it begins with our heart. Love the Lord with all your heart. It's, again, empty traditions. That will keep, it's not a, your, your heart's not there. It's like, you know, I'm just like going through the motions because I've always done it that way before. The truth is loving God begins in the heart. So we want to have words with works. We want to have our doctrine with our deeds, creed with our conduct. As 2 Timothy said, we saw that verse earlier, that we want to make sure and have the form and substance. We want to have make sure that we have the power to help us. All right. And then the fourth thing, that causes us to, to walk in hypocrisy. It's not just formula. It's not just performance. It's not just empty tradition. But it's also when we take on this better than you attitude. We judge people. Now, why in the world would we do that? I mean, don't people know that judging's bad? Well, there's a lot of reasons. But the, probably the number one reason why we judge others is it makes us feel better. I mean, it just does. I don't, you know, if I start thinking about my own problems, my own weaknesses, my own, you know, addictions and habits, I, I don't feel good. So how about I find somebody else that I can give my attention to? And then, you know, think in my heart about them or even say it. Maybe I'll have the audacity and the bravado to speak it out, you know, and cast, you know, some kind of judgmental word. And then, you know, then I can walk away and say, well, you know, they needed to hear that. Somebody needed to tell them. You know, that's, you know, it's, it's, it's the truth. Jesus says that when we, when we judge others, he says it's actually ironic. There's an irony built into when we judge others. And the irony is, is that we have a mess in our own lives. And often we don't even, we're not even aware of it. We're not even aware of it. Notice what Jesus says. He says, why would you focus on the flaw in someone else's life and fail to notice the glaring flaws in your own? How could you say to your friend, let me show you where you're wrong when you're guilty of even more? You're being hypercritical and a hypocrite. That's from the Passion Translation. I thought that was good because it's when we're hypercritical, we're probably involved in hypocrisy. First, acknowledge and deal with your own blind spots, and then you'll be capable of dealing with the blind spot of your friend. Not that it's not true that they don't have something going on. He's just saying, usually it's bigger for us. And that's really where the focus should be anyways. That God says, I don't want you to have a faith, a religion without repentance. We need to be honest with our own selves. The Pharisees, who were hypocrites, Jesus said time and time again. He says, he says, they just aspire to seem more important than others. And that becomes the seedbed of judging. I want to feel, my self-esteem doesn't feel so good. I don't feel so good about myself. How can I make myself feel better? I'll judge others. And that becomes the motive for a lot of people. And, and the danger is 
we're, we feel justified in doing it. You know, oh yeah, it's, it's the right thing to do. We, we, we need to do it. We feel better, we feel justified. There was a time when Jesus was teaching in the temple and some people had found this woman, I guess caught her in the very act of adultery evidently. This is in the Gospel of John chapter 8. Bring her, they throw her down in front of Jesus and they say, Moses commanded us to stone this woman. I didn't. Remember, we looked at that last week where they're always saying Moses commanded this. And so, but they're saying, we're supposed to throw rocks. And so they kind of stir up the crowd. Everybody grabs a rock to throw at this lady. Now, we don't really do that today, right? We're not, we don't throw rocks to, to kill people. We do throw rocks. They're usually verbal rocks, right? They're, they're judgmental statements. But I, have, I was thinking to myself, what kind of rock you know, what, what, what I use, you know, well, I guess, you know, if that lady who was caught in the act of adultery, if she was married, I'm guessing her husband would probably choose the bigger one, right? You know, like, hey, you know, you're going down because this, this is like meant to kill, right? This one, I guess, could kill you, certainly, if it hits you hard enough. Maybe the husband's friends, maybe she had offended some people that never forgave her, and they were looking for their day, they're saying, you're getting your comeuppance today, baby. It's happening. And then there's other people that might not have had an ax to grind. Maybe they're just like, you know, religious folk. You know, oh, yep, it's what we do. Let's take her down. Time to throw the rock. Jesus comes into that scene. He's there, and he, and he speaks into that scene. And he says, he, no, here, he says, he says this. Now listen, this is important. It's, it's, an, it's, it's addressing this issue of judging and not having an attitude of repentance. Here's what he says. The sinless one among you, he's speaking to everybody who's got a stone, everybody who's holding up their stone, you go first. Throw the stone. Now the story goes that nobody threw their stone. One by one they dropped it. I'm guessing that the people that had the big stone dropped theirs last. But they dropped it, and they all end up walking away, leaving Jesus alone with this, this lady in the street, and he goes, neither do I judge you. And then he says, go and sin no more. Listen, there's something in us that just wants to throw that stone. It just makes us feel righteous and right and good about our own problems. But Jesus' answer to us is drop the rock. Drop it. Just put it in the hands of God. There's plenty of people that will take you. You're not, you don't need to do it. There's plenty of people out there. You can be the, per, the voice of compassion, the voice of, 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 of being a life giver to people around you. Don't. Those are the things, those four things, when we're, Reduce everything, Christianity, down to some formulas where it's all about performance, what people think of me. I get my validation that way. When it's empty traditions and maybe God did something in the past and I'm always looking back that way. Or just this attitude of being a judgmental person. Those, listen, that's a sickness. Hypocrisy is not a problem. It is an illness. It is an illness. It's a sickness of the soul. Now the good news is God heals he is our healer, and he's happy to bring healing into your life if you just go to him and ask. What does that look like? Well, the way we get healing from God, from hypocrisy, begins with looking in the mirror and not running away. There's plenty of people that they hear something bad about themselves, and they might even acknowledge it, but they don't want to bring it to God and say, God, I am a sinner. I need your mercy. I need your forgiveness. I need your healing in my life. You see, when we do repentance, which means you confess what's true about you, the things that aren't good about you and that are true about you, and when I confess those things, there's, it's like a, a, a cleansing of my soul. It's like taking a shower or taking a bath, getting your soul clean. You know, in our culture, there's a lot of people that are interested in being clean, just not on the inside. You know, it's like one of the big crazes right now is eating clean, right? Probably everybody here has heard that. Eating clean. What is that? Well, you know, it means I, 
You know, I don't eat the nitrates and the chemicals and the GMOs, and I don't want processed food and refined sugar. I'm going to eat clean, you know, that came, you know, straight from the farm or, what, you know, however you define it for you. The focus on eating clean instead of, because that's easier, actually. As hard as it is, that's easier than being clean and letting the focus of God, you clean me inside. The Pharisees had the same thing. They, they did eat clean because they lived back in the day, but they were still concerned about things that came in. They ingested dirt, things that were unclean on their utensils, on their plates, on their cups. And Jesus points out that, hey, your focus is all about what's coming in you, making sure that's clean instead of what's coming out. Woe to you, teachers and the, uh, of the law and Pharisees, that's our word again, the word of the today, right? You hypocrites, you clean the outside of the cup. That would be like for us today. You're all about eating clean and going to the gym and taking care of your, your exterior body. But inside they're full of, and he lists a couple of things. The list could go on. It's not just greed and self-indulgence. But he lists, I mean, for us, right, nobody here is greedy. So that's why we got to, what does that mean in today in American? It's, it's consumerism, right? Now we go, oh, yeah, I'm like, I get, I, yeah, I'm not greedy, but I might have some consumerism going on in my life. But it's not my fault. It's all the commercials I watch. You know, somebody should throw those people in jail. You know, I'm a victim here, you know. I mean, that's, right, that's, but it's greed. It's, it's what's happening inside of us. And he says our self-indulgence, not really caring about our environment or, you know, the, there's a new term, the ESG, environmental, social, corporate governance. And companies that, uh, that want funding through, the, for, through Wall Street and all kinds of, 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 uh, of funding, ESG. But really what it is, is it's, it's what's happening. Am I caring about what's going on or is it just all about me? And Jesus says, hey, listen, this is the focus. If your focus is on the exterior, you end up in hypocrisy in your life. Next is integrity. Integrity. Integrity means that there's minimal or preferably no incongruency. We already looked at that. All of us have some incongruency in what our stated values are and how we live them out. But we're trying to merge that, be integral. Integrity. What we say is what we do. And we don't act two different ways. You know, you don't act one way Sunday morning, and then if I bump into you or somebody bumps into you on Monday morning, it's like it's a different you. Oh, yeah, this is, this is the work me, you know, and this is the party me, and uh, this is the, you know, the, the hinge me, and, you know, all kinds of, you know, uh, ways that we can, we can spin out. No, you're the same person. You're the same person. Peter struggled with this. Now, we know Peter had a lot of struggles, but, you know, he had, Jesus commissioned him as a key pillar of the church. And he was a key pillar of the church and did a lot of amazing things, you know, to advance the kingdom of God. One of those things that Paul did is he went and helped plant a church in Antioch along with his buddy Barnabas. And they were talking about how everybody's equal in God's eyes. Everybody matters in God's eyes, including Jews and Gentiles. And in that day, there was a huge rift between Jews and Gentiles. They didn't like each other, and there was so much racial inequality, that, and there was so much distrust and hatred. They would actually walk days out of their way around a city, because if, if, you know, a Jew would, if there was, if there was Gentiles there, or there was Samaritans there. And, and so here in this little church, Antioch, uh, that, that was not there. They were, they were eating together. They were in small groups together. They were doing life together. A couple, Peter would come down from time to time and be, and be part of that. Well, one time, Peter goes down and some religious leaders, some Christians, Christian, they're, they're leaders up in the church in Jerusalem. They come and they are unredeemed in that part of their life. And so they still see it as, uh, you know, separate but equal. You know, we, we, that's part of the history of our, of our country, separate but equal. And that's what they were doing. They were saying, yeah, yeah, we're equal, but we're not eating with you. We're not really hanging out with you because you're less because you're less. And, P and so Paul, even Peter does this. So Paul calls him out. We see this in Galatians. 
He says, then all of the other Jewish Christians and even Barnabas became hypocrites. Who's a hypocrite? He's not about Christians in the church. He's not about leaders in the church. It can happen to any of us if we're not careful. And Barnabas became, by following Peter's example, he was the, he was the chief hypocrite. Though they certainly knew better. So we need to be careful that we're, we don't fall into that. That, we're, that we get influenced by other people and they cause us to really come unhinged from our, from our, from our stated values. We know what's better. We know better, but we let other people influence us. And so we need repentance first, first and foremost. Two, we need integrity in our life. Three, we need honesty, radical honesty, radical honesty about ourselves. This is who I am. If we're not honest about it, then we tend to go for the rock. You know, I'm going to, this, that's how I feel better. But God's way of helping us to see who we are and get healed is radical honesty. Paul had to do this. Paul wrote half of the letters, half of the, the books of the New Testament and was always pursuing, you know, being a person of integrity, but it was aware of his shortcomings. And he's talking about the gospel, and, and, and here's what he says. He says, this is Paul speaking. He says, I can testify that the word, he's talking about the Bible, is true and deserves to be received by all. For Jesus Christ came into the world to bring sinners back to life. Now notice this. Even me, the worst sinner of all. And sometimes people read that and they think, well, he's being humble. I don't think so. I think he's being honest. I think in his mind, he saw for who he was and what he had done, not comparing himself to other people just before God. And he goes, I'm, I'm the worst of them all. You know, when you have this attitude, you tend to be less judgmental. One of the things that, that uh, I've had to do over the years when somebody comes and talks to me or they want prayer and, they're t- and, they're, and then that little, that little demon tries to speak and say, oh, you're better than them. Then I, I, sometimes I'll just have to remind myself of some of, the, some of the, the things that I've done. Hurting people, offensive to God, offensive. And it, you know what? It gets me off the pedestal pretty quick. And you just remember, you know what, I, 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 don't, I have no place having that kind of attitude. I need to be the healing hands of Jesus. And we can do that when we have right perspective, when we have the right perspective. Lastly, well, it really comes down to progress. And the reason is because we'll never be perfect. We'll never get to a place where it's perfectly merged. Jesus did, but even Peter couldn't. Even Barnabas couldn't. Paul struggled with it. I mean, we'll never get to that place. So what we're looking to do is make progress, not perfection. We're looking to make progress. It's all about walking with God, walking with Jesus. That's why here at Vineyard, we talk about your next step. Everyone here, including me, we all have a next step with God. What is your next step? Because if you're not taking a next step, it means you're not walking with God. Because you can only walk with God if you're taking steps. And so what is your next step? For some of you, your next step is baptism. You haven't been baptized. And that's your next step. Some of you, you've never figured out, taken the time to think about how, how was I designed? What am I supposed to do with my life? Or maybe you did years ago, but you're just at a different place today. And your next step is to be clear on that. And you need to be involved in growth track. That's your next step. Some of you, you have very little in your spiritual life that nobody knows about. And if you think about it, okay, they know I go to church. They know I give. Somebody knows I give. Somebody knows I go to church. Somebody knows I pray. Some, I think every Christian should have something they do in their life that nobody, even if you're married, they don't even know. Nobody knows but God. There's, there's something powerful that happens when we anchor ourselves to, hey, this is not about performance. I don't, it, it's not about what people say because nobody even knows. 
I'm not looking for validation or recognition from anybody. And some of you need that. You need that in your life. I love this final verse. For the lovers of God may suffer adversity. It can be tough, right? There's an endurance factor in walking with Christ. And stumble over and over and over again. Seven times even. But they will continue to rise over and over and over again. That's God's promise for you. Will you fall? Yeah. But will you get up? Will you rise? Will you learn something? Will you depend more on the strength of Christ? You know, over the centuries, Christians, when they get, there's a struggle when you're in the world. You, you get tempted to do things you wouldn't normally do. And so some Christians, they just have decided, I'm going to go join a monastery. I'm going to completely remove myself from the world. Just live with a band of Christians. Sometimes people go and buy a farm or something and just live in the middle of nowhere and they homeschool their kids and it's just, just, just them, you know, try to reduce the temptation. Avoid all contact with the world. Then there's the other end of the continuum. Some people just say, well, I might as well just assimilate with the world because it's just too hard. So I'll just be like the world. You know, and they throw up their hands and they say, I'll just wallow in my sin like a moral pig like we all are, you know. Nothing I can do to help this. There is another option than just avoiding the world or completely assimilating like the world. And that's walking with Christ. Each day asking, God, you change me. Examining our heart, aligning areas that are off base, and the power of a small group where other people are praying for you. And you have role models in your life that say, I can do it because other people are doing it. I can do better. I can make progress. I can get up when I fall down. And for some of you, that's your next step. But the first step, the first step of all in walking with God is asking Christ into your life, saying, God, I need you in my life. I need your help. I need your strength. And for some of you, that is your next step. Let's bow our heads and we'll pray. I'm going to ask if you would to just bow your heads, close your eyes if you're online, would you posture yourself just in a moment of prayer? Just going to God, saying, God, I need you. I want you. Some of you, your next step is putting your faith in Christ right here, right now. That's why you're here. God brought you here. Some of you, you weren't even thinking of coming this morning, but you're here. And I'm, I'm going to let you know that God knew years and years ago you'd be here today just so that you could hear this message because God wanted to speak to you. For some of you, this is the reason you've been distant. You've used this very excuse. Why get involved? There's all these hypocrites. For some of you, you know that's too close to home and you need to get some things right. God's calling you today to depend on him, to depend on his power. And I'm going to ask you to pray with me just right where you're at. I'm not going to ask you to come forward. I'm not going to ask you to stand up. I'm just going to ask you right where you're at. Just pray this prayer. Whisper it. This is just between you and God. And if you're saying, Andy, that's me. I need to take the step towards Christ today to receive his forgiveness, to receive his power. Then I want to lead you in a prayer. And if that's you, I'm going to ask you just to let me know, just boldly, just let me know. Put your hand up right now, just, just, just so I can see. I know who I'm praying for. Okay, bless you. I see you. Who, yep, I see you. Yep. Somebody else, keep your hand up just for a moment. Say, yes, that's me. I'm going to pray. Okay, put your hands down. Thank you. Would you pray this prayer? Say, God, today, I repent for my own arrogance, for my own sinful attitude, and certainly any things I've done. Would you say, God, clean me, cleanse me. I ask for your forgiveness. I ask for your strength, the power to live out the values that I know I, that I, I want to have in my life. Would you say, God, give me a community of people that I can walk with? that will strengthen me. I wasn't meant to do this alone. 
Give me new life. Give me a clear conscience. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Would you congratulate those who said that prayer? You know, I certainly am proud of you. I said that prayer uh, more than once as I was trying to figure out my Christianity. And it begins a walk that where other people want to journey with you. And we certainly do as well. If you, you have your Connect card, if you're here in the, in the in-person service, let us know that you prayed with me. Or if you have any prayer requests, you can, that's attached to your program. You can just write on there anything you want. Put it in the clear box as you leave. If you're online, there's a way for you to do that. That's coming up right now. Well, we have step two right after the service. Even if you haven't taken step one, we'd love to have you in there. Begin your uh, discovery of how God made you and how you can make a difference. Also, if you'd like to contribute financially towards the vision of this church, there's some ways that you can do that. We certainly uh, invite you to be part of that. Don't feel like you need to. Certainly do, do that if it feels you know, like a ritual or an empty tradition. We'd much rather have we're just glad that you're here. We'd much rather have your heart just tender before the Lord. That's, 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 that's our heart for you. Okay, would you stand with me? Go ahead. We're going to close on a final song. Let me pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for, for how you are doing something amazing, amazing in our lives. Lord, I thank you for the healing that you're going to unleash in our church. Lord, that we're going to do our part to walk with you. We look to you to help us. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's sing.